So in this video, we're going to be looking at um, the animal kingdom, phylum chordata, subphylum vertebrata. We're looking at, at the class aves, A-V-E-S. Aves refers to the birds. And so we're going to look at the adaptations uh, of God's creation of, of the aves, the birds. Roughly speaking, there are about 9,000 different species of birds. Again, they're classified in the class aves. Uh, classification can be based on uh, their foot and how their, their feet uh, are located. It can be habitat, it can be behavior, it can be the shape of the beaks. Uh, when we look at different types of birds, um, birds of prey have notched beaks and sharp talons. That's going to be the claws that are on, on their feet. Um, they're going to have shorebirds, which have long slender bills and, and long legs. You can have the waterfowl that have the webbed toes like the ducks and broad bills. So, you know, a wide variety of organisms are, are classified as birds. And our birds, again, they have these adaptations for the niche for where God placed them in his design. So the aves are the only grouping of animals to have feathers. The feathers is made up of keratin, and there's two basic types of feathers. There's the contour feathers. These feathers are going to overlap. They're going to be uh, broad. They're going to be flat. They're going to be helping to lift the surface. Then you have the down feathers. Now, the, the down feathers are the feathers that provide um, for insulation and to prevent from body loss. Um, losing body heat and back in the day they used to make pillows with um, feathers they would use the down feathers and they would stuff those and, and you would sleep on a, a feather pillow and I can remember uh, my great-grandmother had uh, down feather pillows and they were very soft birds are homothermic that means that they are able to control their own body temperature. As a matter of fact, they have a high body temperature. Uh, this enables the bird to, to be very active in cold weather. And then the feathers can also serve as insulation to help uh, keep that body heat in. And then you have the feathers that are used for flight. And everything, and everything about, about the bird, the bird is, designed is designed for flight. For flight. So, so amazing. amazing. I mean, our being, being able, able to fly, fly our design, design of the of airplane, airplane wing, wing is completely is by observing how God how designed, God designed the, birds. the birds. And we'll start, and we'll start off with, with the breastbone breast sticks, sticks out. out. Uh, yeah, it's called the keel. keel. And, and it's, it's um, um, if you can imagine where your sternum is and having, and having that stick that straight, straight out, out, it allows, it allows for, for very, very large muscles to attach. And these muscles have to be strong in order for the bird to be able to fly. The bird, the bird also, also in, in, addition in addition to having, having lungs, lungs, has, has air, air sacs. sacs. Now, now imagine, imagine we do our favorite, do our favorite chapter, chapter, cell respiration, cell respiration and, and you are doing two a day two workouts, workouts in, athletics, in athletics, and you get, and you really, get really sore. sore. And you get and really, you really sore because you built up lactic acid, acid because, because you ran, ran out of oxygen, oxygen to, get to get to your muscles and your muscles get sore. For a bird, for a bird. If, a bird if a bird was to go, to go into that anaerobic, anaerobic respiration, respiration and start building up lactic acid, acid. Its, muscles its muscles got sore, sore. bird could be bird falling from hundreds, hundreds of feet when the muscles, muscles give out. Give out. It's, not it's not a good, good thing. thing. So to so keep, to keep that, that from that happening, happening God, designed God designed the birds to not only have lungs, but to have air sacs. So when the bird breathes in, so again, when that bird breathes in, what happens, what happens is there's, is there's nine, nine air sacs, air sacs. and so that so air is going to go into its air sacs, sacs. and then when and it then breathes in again, again the, air the air that's in the air sacs, sacs is going to go to the lungs, lungs. and then and the then air the that out was breathed in will go into the air sacs, sacs. and then and what was what in the lungs can then be diffused over and moved throughout the body. So it doesn't, the air sacs are not like additional lungs, but they're additional Structures, structures that, that help, help um, maintain, maintain that, that constant, constant flow of, of oxygen, oxygen within, within the bird. The bird. And, because and because the bird is small, small the lungs, the lungs are, small, are small, this is this just is a just way, way to maintain, maintain that, that high level, level of oxygenated, oxygenated blood, blood um, for, the, for uh, the, uh, the bird. The bird. Additionally, Additionally, the wishbone, the wishbone uh, when, uh, we, when say, we say, you know, hold the wishbone, 
uh, and you pull uh, and you see which side you get. Well, the wishbone is a clavicle and ribs that are fused together. And the purpose of the wishbone is to help stabilize the shoulder so the shoulder doesn't collapse in mid-flight. So there are six characteristics of birds. They are warm-blooded. Another thing is if we look at the bones, the bones are hollow. Now I wouldn't say they're, they're hollow like a tube. Uh, they're more honeycomb shaped so that you, you have um, a honeycomb structure within the bones. What this does is the honeycomb structure gives strength to the bones so they don't easily break. If it was completely hollow, the bones would break too easily. But being honeycombed, it gives strength to the bones, but it also lightens the bones um, so that the bird can fly. The bird has a four-chambered heart, two atria, and two ventricles. They have feathers, they lay eggs, and they have scales on their feet and their legs. So again, another you know thing that I just want to re-emphasize is that everything about the bird, um, for most of the birds, not all, but for most of the birds, is designed for flight. And one of those is having that honeycombed um, set up for the bones, and this gives the bones strength but it also lightens the bones. The birds, again, have that four-chambered heart. It's a double-loop circulatory system. It separates the oxygenated blood from the deoxygenated blood. Works just like the human circulatory system. Um, you know, again, they have that, that keel uh, that allows those big muscles to attach for flight. Um, they have the air sacs that allow for flight. Uh, and then, in addition to that, they will also typically only have uh, one organ instead of two. So one kidney instead of two, one ovary instead of two. All of that designed to help lighten the bird, to help the bird for flight. So the birds um, also have a beak rather than teeth. Uh, one of the cool things is if we look, and I'll mention it again, but if we look over here at the little toucan on the right, uh, the toucan's uh, beak is made up of keratin, the same kind of material that your fingernails are made out of. They also have a very acute vision, uh, and then they have wonderful um, muscle reflexes. Now I mentioned the, the two types of feathers, the contour and the down feathers, and here we just have a photograph to help you see that we have the uh, down feathers on the uh, left, and you have the contour feathers that are going to be over on the right. Contour feathers are what... Um, give the bird its shape, it helps it for flight. Down feathers are gonna be the more um, fluffy uh, feathers. They're gonna be underneath the contour. They're gonna help to trap heat, help the body maintain its body temperature. One of the things you can do is you can identify a bird based on its feather. So if we were to um, look over here at a feather, now let's take that feather and let's make it larger. So here we've got the feather, we made it larger. And so there are barbs that are on the feather. And those barbs, uh, you've seen when a feather looks like it's just kind of been rough and it's the, um, the sections of, of the feather have been separated, the barbs have come uh, unhooked. And so a lot of times you'll see a bird preening itself and what it's doing is it's reattaching these barbs. Well, let's take the barbs and let's look at those even closer. And it has little barbules. And those little barbules, if we make it even closer than that, has little hooklets. And so it has barbs, barbules, and hooklets that all connect, that hold the feather together, and that would keep air from passing through that, and that would help with it being aerodynamic. And then here I've got a, another little close-up where you can see the barbs, you can see the barbules and the hooklets. And then how these are arranged can help in identification if we had a feather of an unknown bird. So if we look at an airplane wing design, it's designed just like the wing of a bird. And so it's designed where you have um, very little, it's kind of curved right here, so the air will move past the top part very quickly. And it moves very quickly across the top because it's not pushing down on the wing. And then it moves very slowly underneath. So the bottom part of the wing is flat so that the air would go slower. And what that does is that causes it to lift the wing up. Now, if we had this part here flat, it would go um, over slower and it would push the wing down. 
So airplane wings are designed after bird wings. They're going to be curved up here at the top, allowing the air to move faster across the top, slower across the bottom, and allowing for lift. And again, we got these designs by observing birds in flight. Amazing. And again, just showing you that same design, here we go, of how you can have that low pressure with the air moving over uh, quickly, higher pressure here causing lift. Again, all of our airplanes are designed based on God's design of, of the birds and the bird wings. It's just wonderful to see how God has given us so many wonderful inventions just by observing his creation. But there are a few birds that can't fly the penguins, the ostriches, and the emus. And just so you're sure, this one's a penguin, this one's an ostrich, this one's an emu. The emus and the ostriches are both uh, flightless birds. They're called ratatas. And um, there was a place back in Texas where I used to live, you could go buy emu burgers if you wanted to try an emu burger. There are some differences between emus and ostriches. Um, your emus are native to Australia. Ostriches are found in Africa. The emus have a darker coloration with dark brown, gray, or black uh, feathers. Uh, the ostriches, they're going to be thicker and they're going to be lighter. And then ostriches are a lot bigger than emus. An emu can be anywhere from 60 to 100 pounds. An ostrich can weigh up to 300 pounds. So um, these are some pictures of when I was in Curacao, and Curacao has an ostrich farm. So I went out and uh, spent some time with some ostriches out at the ostrich farm. A few things I want to show you. Yeah, um, here I, you've got me uh, feeding the ostriches, but um, let's look at the ostrich um, egg. Here I am. They've got an ostrich egg right here. I'm holding on to the rope for balance. But I'm standing on that ostrich egg, and that egg doesn't break. So this is what the inside of the ostrich egg looks like. Look at how thick that is. So you would actually need a chisel and a hammer to break that shell. One ostrich egg is approximately equal to a dozen and a half chicken eggs. Um, I have not eaten one, but they say that it has a slightly sweet flavor, and it's a little bit more fluffy in texture compared to a chicken egg. Uh, but uh, if you get a chance in Curacao, you can visit the ostrich farm, feed the ostriches, and then check out those eggs. It's pretty wild. So here we have the uh, flamingos. There's six different species of flamingos, but you would have to be trained in order to tell the difference between them. On average, uh, the flamingos weigh about eight pounds and are four to five feet tall. They uh, feed by stirring up mud with their feet and then they use their um, their beak, they scoop up that muddy water with their beaks, they strain out the animals, drain the water, and they do this all with the head upside down, which is pretty cool. The pink color of the flamingo is due to the beta carotene that's found in the crustacean that the uh, flamingos eat. Now, flamingos that are, are kept uh, in captivity at zoos, they have to have this added to their diet in order to have that. But uh, flamingos, when they're born, they're actually born white. And then they get that pink coloration due to their diet. So here you can see a little baby flamingo up here, and it's a uh, white color, uh, maybe even um, an appearance of gray. But it's going to be that way for the first two years of its life. The underside of the flamingo's wing is black, and then you're only going to see that black coloration when they're flying. Fun fact, there are more fake flamingos in the world than there are real flamingos. Now this is a photograph from Yucatan Progresso. Uh, I took this on one of the winter home trips. I want you to notice this uh, pink coloration of the water. Uh, the water contains sulfur, salts, and algae. And so this uh, over in Progreso area of Mexico, uh, there are flamingos, wild flamingos that uh, migrate to this area and they eat this algae. And it's eating the algae that gives them that pink color. But you can see that the water is that uh, deep pink color and the picture doesn't even do it justice as far as how pink it is. 
but that's due to the algae that's in that water. Now that water is also very, very salty. As a matter of fact, this particular lagoon right here is seven times more salty than the ocean. So you have to be very careful going out into this water. There, there's actually a little family that uh, lives here that collects the salt and they sell the salt. And here you can see some of that salt that th that family collects. This is a Mayan family and they sell the salt and you can buy this, this pink salt here for about a dollar a bag, US dollars. And I apologize, these pictures came out sideways, but this right here and this right here are showing you the pictures of um, what the family's home looks like. And they live here, you can see back behind them is, is where that pink lake is, where they collect the salt for a living. And then you can see how they make their food, the little tortillas out here on their flat shelf. Um, when I was there, uh, the the lady right here, she was making um, homemade tortillas and, and homemade tacos and you could buy some of those from her. They were amazing. Uh, this is Cosmel. And uh, in Cosmel, uh, when I take my students to see the Mayan ruins, there's an area where you can hold uh, some of the local wildlife and we were able to hold one of the little parrots. This right here, is a photograph of my honor society trip where I took the students to the safari and they were feeding the um, the ostriches. You have to be very careful. If you'll notice right here, this student uh, is holding, you can see how they're holding that food right in between. That's because the bird's gonna come up and right between he's gonna grab that food out of their hand very quickly. And if you don't hold that food just like that, that ostrich will nip your fingers. And here are some of just uh, the beautiful birds uh, on that rainforest hike that we did out in uh, Honduras. Again, just opportunities to see some of the beautiful birds uh, in Honduras. So here you have the toucan and you have that beautiful beak that it has and it's huge. Imagine how heavy that would have been had that been uh, like a bone. But this right here is made of keratin, which is the same material that your fingernails are made of. It can actually crack and chip, and then uh, it has to repair itself. Here we have penguins. They're primarily found in the southern hemisphere around uh, South Africa, South America, Australia, and New Zealand. About as northmost as the penguin species will be found will be the Galapagos penguins in the Galapagos Islands. Uh, the number one location in the United States as far as penguin conservation is the um, Atlanta Aquarium. And uh, with the Atlanta Aquarium, they map out all of the, the penguins as far as their genetics and their breeding. And if a zoo or if a, um, another aquarium would like to breed penguins, they contact the Atlanta Aquarium and then from there, um, they make sure that, that they're keeping the genetics clean, that they're maintaining the species, uh, and they're documenting the, the breeding so that they know exactly uh, where each of the, the penguins came from and they, they can keep an eye on the genetics for genetic purposes. And then just to give you an idea, there are different types of penguins. You've got the Galapagos penguin over here, the king penguin, the emperor penguin. You can, you can pick out your favorite type of penguin that you like. And then showing you that they can go from 37 inches down to 18 inches. So, you know, just a little over a foot up to three feet, a little over three feet in height.